Spirituality creates influence in the church, but success gives you greater influence in the marketplace. And make no mistake about it, the marketplace is the primary concern for the expansion of the kingdom. Welcome to 83K Nation. Dr. Keith Johnson here, your Christian success strategist. This show is all about empowering you with the strategies, skills, tactics, and tools to help you reach your next personal, professional, and financial summits to increase your influence, impact, and income fast. Life changes at the point of decisions. If you want things to speed up in your life, you are one decision away from things happening faster and quicker than you've ever imagined. Decisions decide wealth. Decisions decide your destiny. You have the power to decide what your future is gonna look like today. I decided what I wanted my future to look like. That's faith, ladies and gentlemen. Faith lives out the contradiction until you see the invisible picture on the inside and you make that invisible picture a reality on the outside. And your job is to hold on to the picture until you see it, taste it, and live in that picture. Come on. That's faith. Hello, 83K Nation. In this season of my ministry, I'm mandating the church to focus on the most important, powerful evangelistic tool we have today, success. It's time we experience spiritual, relational, professional, and financial wealth. Why is this important? Spirituality gives you influence in the church, but success gives you influence in the marketplace. Make no mistake about it, the marketplace is the primary concern of the advancement of the kingdom of God. My heart is to equip you to break free from the middle class and increase your impact, influence, and income fast. I want to take you into a live session I did called Success School. I know you're going to be challenged and changed by this message. I want to talk to you today about what I call the school of success. Bishop asked me, he said, I said, Bishop, you know all the things that I could bring to the table. What do you really want me to talk about? He said, success. And so I said, okay, well, let's do a school of success on Saturday. But I want to share with you before we move into the success strategies that I want to give you today. I want to just share with you my journey so you kind of comprehend like where I came from, all right? I began my journey to where I am today as a professional sinner. No, no, I wasn't, I wasn't a good sinner, huh? I was a professional sinner. There's a big difference, right? Because when I started, man, I was like John Travolta in... You know, I, I was boogie woogie, and all, I worked all day to boogie woogie all night long. I, 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 seriously, I would work 12 hours a day, party all night, chase women, do drugs, get drunk. I mean, I smoke so much marijuana. I mean, people today are saying, oh, we're going to go to Mars, Elon, right? We're going to Mars. I'm like, dude, I already been to Mars and back. I'm <laughs> I got so high in my bedroom, I went to Mars and back and came back and had Twinkies all over my face. I said, I thought, <laughs> any old stonies know what I'm talking about? I'm like, wow, you know. And so I was young. I, I, I was, you know, 23 years old. And I was raised in object poverty. My father was... Uh, part of Satan's Escorts, which was a motorcycle Harley Davidson club. And my father was the president. And one of the pictures I still have of my father, of the few, is him going downstairs. And I'm upstairs as a little kid and hearing two shots, bam, bam. And I'm like, whoa, what was that? And my dad comes up the stairs with two dead Doberman pinchers bleeding and he's cussing and he throws the, 
he throws the Doberman pinchers out of the house. He says, those Dobermans ate all of our dope. I'm like, this is how my, my dad, my dad's nickname in the motorcycle club was drunk. You know, every, every Harley Davidson guy, you get a nickname, hey, spider. My, my dad was drunk. Can you imagine what he was all about? We never had any food in the refrigerator. Open up the refrigerator. I'm young. I'm a, I'm a little child. I'm hungry. I got to go to school. Open up the refrigerator. There's a six-pack of Budweiser, but no food. I never missed a single day of school because I so looked forward to going to school because I could eat a free lunch. I realized early that money is simply the problem of misdirected money. It wasn't that my dad didn't make any money. They just misdirected it in the wrong place. But I became the environment that I was raised in. And so, just like my parents, you see, influence is subtle, but it's so powerful. That's why you got to be careful who you hang with. If you're going to become a success in life, you, you got to watch out because other people's views, other people's belief systems can become yours. As a child, you don't pick your belief systems. You absorb them from teachers, from your parents, from preachers who are all broke. And you bring it into your belief system and then you become it. So influence is subtle, yet it's powerful. It shapes where you're being directed in life. You are today the belief systems that your parents, preachers, and teachers taught you. Now, how many of you come here to learn today? Raise your hand if you came to learn. Yeah, yeah that's your first problem. Because <laughs> the first thing you need to do is unlearn a lot of junk Amen. that you've been taught throughout your life. I had, I, I had a huge learning curve. But I became, I absorbed, I became my environment. That's why the other thing that is so powerful too is that environments can also transform you. Because even though I was raised in poverty, I had a friend named Grant Gumbert. His father was a successful doctor in our city. And I'll never forget the time I went over to his house for the first time. Gated community, big house, I rolled up in my bicycle down the driveway, gates open, wow, whoa. Pull up, he's got a full court, he's got a big basketball court, garage doors are open, Mercedes, BMW, beautiful car. I'm like, wow, I never seen this before. Go inside his house, hey, you want something to eat? He opens up the refrigerator, refrigerator is full of food. Open up the pantry, potato chips, snacks, everything you could possibly. I, 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 thought, I thought I died and went to heaven. I'm like, wow. <laughs> went down in the basement. He had all the games. He had Pac-Man. Some of you don't even know what that is, right? <laughs> he had Atari. He had, he had all, all the games, pool table. He had, he had, all, he had a, Xbox. He had Xbox. Xbox, yeah, he had Xbox. <laughs> He had everything. I'm like, wow, this is like amazing. And then I remember I had to go home. I didn't want to go. <laughs> I'm getting that anointing like the presser yesterday. <laughs> I didn't want to go. I'm like, can I just live with you, Grant? He's like, no, man, my dad's coming home. Get out of here. <laughs> and I jumped back on my motorcycle or my, on my bicycle, started pedaling my way out of the driveway, and as I was leaving, the one thing that couldn't be denied 
was that exposure to new things is transformational. You see, you can't want something you've never tasted. But once you taste it, mm, there's no wanting to go back. And at the end of the driveway, I looked over my right shoulder. And I saw the big house, the nice cars, a new way of living that I didn't even know existed. And I said, someday, that's the way I'm going to live. Life changes at the point of decisions. If you want things to speed up in your life, you are one decision away from things happening faster and quicker than you've ever imagined. I made a decision. Decisions decide wealth. Decisions decide your destiny. Decisions are so powerful. You have the power to decide what your future is going to look like today. You see, today everybody's life can change. Because you're one decision away from it. Come on, somebody shout yes. yes. I decided what I wanted my future to look like. As I rode away as that young boy. But I still had to go back to hell. I had to go back to not that reality, but my reality. And I had to live 34 years with the contradiction. The picture of what that young boy decided that's what I want. And the realities of where I was at. That's faith, ladies and gentlemen. Faith lives out the contradiction until you see the invisible picture on the inside and you make that invisible picture a reality on the outside. And your job is to hold on to the picture until you see it, taste it, and live in that picture. Come on. That's faith. Are you an aspiring Christian author, speaker, or coach? Then I've got something just for you. I'm opening up a few spaces in my private mentoring program, 83K Academy. In less than six weeks, I will take you through a step-by-step process to launch your expert business completely from scratch. You will get a brain dump of my 25 years in this business from launching a multi-million dollar brand writing a bestseller, traveling the globe as a paid speaker, and even consulting billionaire entrepreneurs and CEOs. This is truly an opportunity of a lifetime to have me personally mentor you to discover your one word as we build your multi-million dollar expert business together. To apply for one of the few remaining spots in the program, head over to 83kacademy.com and submit your application to qualify now. Godspeed, my friend. So here, here I am, 23, 24 years old, professional sinner, and I'm working because I have that picture. I want to be successful. I would show up to work a half hour early. Work all day. And I would be the last one. They would close the door. I was there before they opened the door and they would close the door. Turn off the lights and I was still there. As my friend Les Brown would say, if you want to succeed in life, you got to be hungry. Touch a neighbor and say, you got to be hungry. Oh, no, you got to be hungry. No, you got to get it down here. You got to be hungry. I know another successful man that said the same thing. His name was Jesus. 
And he, sta- he stood up a bunch of folks who weren't hungry. And he yelled, hey, those who are hunger and those who thirst, hey, wake up. Those shall be filled. That means the unhungry are anorexia. They have anorexia dreams. They have anorexia lives. Hunger is the key to successful living. And so, I was hungry. I wasn't saved, but I was hungry. And this company, they brought in these Christians. We're turning over the staff. We're trying a new program. They brought in this manager that was a Christian. And you know how they do when, when they change up sales teams. They bring in the manager, and then the manager has all of his cronies that he likes, brings the whole team. Well, I was number one, so the owner of the company's like, you ain't, you ain't getting rid of this guy. And they came, and so here I am. I'm showing up early. They show up late. They bring their Bibles and they go over in the corner and before work starts, now they're already late and then they're praying another half hour. They're confessing the Bible. They're praying. They're, sh- they're keys to my Honda, keys to my Honda. They're shoot a mosquito. They're shoot a mosquito. They're, they're tie a bow tie. I ain't tying nobody's bow tie. I'm on the phones. I'm working it, baby, huh? Why they tie my bow tie? I'm working it, getting some sales. Two hours late. I've only been to work for three hours, and they just start. But they know I'm such a, because I hated sinners. I, I mean, I hated Christians. I didn't like them. Because my view of a Christian was you had to be a nerd, you had to be poor, and you had to be lazy. I'm just being honest. My view really hasn't changed too much. (laughs) 30 years later, I look around, I'm like, dear God, help me. I'm I'm glad we got some sharp people in this church. (laughs) Thank God for Bishop Bart Pierce, man. That's why I don't go too many places anymore, man. I'm like, man, I don't know if I could take it anymore. (laughs) I'm like, I don't want to be a nerd. I'm too too good looking to be a nerd. Come on, somebody say amen. Good looking people don't hang with nerds, man. I I wasn't lazy. I I was hungry. I wasn't waiting around for God to do for me what God told me to do. Yeah. Touch a neighbor and say, I think he's talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I sure didn't want to be broke. Man, I don't want to be broke. So I don't, Christian? But then I, I came across this gal. And she was going through some struggles in her life, and she lived close to me, and her husband died. And, she, and, and they were friends with, with my family, and so I knew she was struggling, so I'd go down there and after work, just before I went out to party, and I'd just stop in, say, hey, how you doing? And I, w- I would look at her, and, and she, I'd say, hey, did you eat? She's crying. Oh, I did. I forgot. I lost my husband. I said, okay, hey, come on. Let me take you out to eat. Come on. Let me take you out to eat. So this went on for six months. And I, I said, finally, I said, hey, you, you want to go out? And finally, I realized that I, I think I have feelings for this girl. And I said, do you want to go out on a date? She's like, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, I said, man, we can go to the bar. 
<laughs> I can show you my moves on the floor, you know. And, and she's like, oh, no, I, I, I ain't, I'm not going to no bar. She said, but you can come to church with me tonight. I'm like, is it like one of those churches where Christians go to? She's like, yeah, man, but you'll like this church. I'm like, well, like, why would I like this church? She said, well, man, they play the guitar. I said, they play the guitar? Really? Like rock and roll music? Like, yeah, they have a drum, and it's really hip. I think you'll really like it. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. I, 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 I wasn't getting a date, so I'm like, okay, I'll go to church with you. I held my, held, held my head down. And off to church we went. And for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel. God loves you. He'll forgive you of all of your sin and radically change your life. You will not be the same when you accept God into your heart and into your life. Your life, I guarantee you, will be changed. I'm like, ooh, I like that. And God will forgive you of all of your past, present, and future sins. I looked over at her. I said, did he just say what I thought he said? You mean everything I've ever... Now, when you're stony and you're a drunk and you're chasing women, how many of you don't know you do some really nasty stuff? And I'm thinking, dear God, God couldn't forgive me of all that. She said, that's what he said, every single thing. I'm like, okay, hey, who, who, wants, to, who wants to change your life? Who wants to be forgiven of everything you've ever done? I'm like... And when I put my hand up, the power of God, I'm, I'm telling you, it was Saul of Tarsus. The power of God hit me. The Spirit of God came inside of me, and when God came in, demons went out, out, out. I was forever changed. I still believe in a gospel that radically radically changes people's lives. Come on, somebody clap if you believe that. And man, I, I, and all of a sudden, any desire for another woman just left me. Uh, desire to smoke marijuana left me. Desire to drink just left me. And it's been 32 years. Never kissed another woman on the lips except for the one who took me to church that day. Come on now. These lips have never touched another sip of alcohol in 32 years. Come on. No gummy bears. <laughs> no gu Oh, yeah, I got you on the gummy bears, didn't I? Uh, I had no gummy bears to go to sleep. No, no marijuana joints. No. 32 years. That's what happens when God comes in a man or woman's heart. Come on, somebody shout, yeah. The number one request we get from entrepreneurs is, hey, I love your books and teachings, but is it possible for you to mentor me? As someone who has served as a business coach and consultant for 30 years, yes, of course I wanna help you. Since you visited this page, it tells me something about you. You're hungry to change your personal, professional, and financial situation. And that's the first requirement that I look for in mentoring people. If that sounds like you, I want to invite you into my private group, 83K Society. This is a tight group of seven figure earners who are ready to scale above and beyond that, as well as people who are accelerating their way to achieving the spiritual and moral goal of success and financial wealth. We've had some amazing testimonies from people I've coached, like Martine, for instance, who just had his first million dollar day. Matt Anderson, a 30 year old who bought a $27 million apartment complex. Justin King, who just had his first $83,000 month. There's Janice Rhodes, who finally published her first book. Then there's James, who made an extra $100,000 building his consulting company. There are two ways to learn, mistakes and mentors. Sadly, in the beginning, I was all alone, learning from a lot of mistakes. But when God crossed my path with millionaire mentors, 
that changed quickly for me. So I made a vow that when I became wealthy, I would become the person that I needed by helping others just like you. 83K Society is all about giving you access to three important things. Mentoring to inform you, coaching to challenge you, and a community to support you. Here's what becoming a mentor of our 83K Society looks like for you. You're getting monthly coaching from me at our Success Symposium. You're getting access to our one-year Millionaire in the Making training program. You're getting access to the Success Vault, a library of trainings on the three pillars of success, confidence, leadership, and wealth valued at over $37,000. You're also receiving fly on the wall interviews with kingdom millionaires and billionaires. And finally, you'll be automatically approved to join our 83K Society community on Facebook. You become what you focus on. If you want to become a baker, you need to study recipes and develop kitchen skills. In the same way, if you want to scale beyond seven figures, you need to study the wealthy. Listen, if you feel like you're going around in circles, you have to change the circles you get around because the fastest way to change your life is to elevate your relationships. That's why my team has created the most incredible free gift offer ever. We are going to let you have a free test drive of this mentoring experience for the first 60 days. If you'd like to continue the mentoring after 60 days, we're going to give you an additional 50% off. The investment of this membership is $83 per month and you will be able to get in for a limited time for only $39. This is a special one-time deal for you to get in to this special 83K society. When you say maybe today, you can have everything I just told you about for two full months. Click the link below and I'll see you at the next Success Symposium. And then I made an awesome discovery that I'm going to talk to you about because I'm going to share these five things for, for living successful here on the earth. I discovered something awesome. I discovered that the image of God was being blurred by his followers. Mm-hmm. I discovered that Christians misrepresent who God is and what God's intent and purpose for our lives are. I'm like, whoa. Because I thought, like, when, when, when I accepted the Lord, now, now I have to go be a nerd. Now, now I have to go be poor all my life. But... An amazing thing happened to me, which is my very first point in our school today. And they'll bring it up on the screen. Success strategy number one in your life is success must become your spiritual and moral obligation to God and the world. Success must become your duty. Success must become your obsession and I, I discovered it because the very first scripture that I ever read in the Bible. How many of you ever had those things where, where you, <laughs> some people I was around, you know, they, they, I, I, I didn't know what, like, what they were talking about. You know, he said, if you need a word from the Lord, they honestly taught me this. Just, just pray to God and open up the Bible and look on the page. Yeah. Have you ever heard that? I mean, be careful because you, you, could, you could turn to, and Judas hung himself. I mean, be careful on that. <laughs> well, 
But, but I turned to a scripture. Honest, this is what happened. I turned, I, I turned my Bible to Joshua 1.8. Yeah. Now, you got to understand, at that point, I had never read a complete book from cover to cover. I cheated my way through high school. You say, seriously, I could not read. And I, I could barely read, barely read, and I couldn't write. Now I write best-selling books. Come on now. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I, I opened up the book, and it was Joshua 1.8. And this is how, and Bonnie was set next to me. We were going to read the Bible together. I opened it up, and I read it like this. This book of the law you shall mediate, she say meditate, meditate <laughs> day and night. Bishop said we had all kinds of time, so be slow with me. <laughs> then you shall do according to what is written, and you shall make. These Christians lied. They said God was going to do everything. They were praying over in the corner waiting for sales. You. You need to take a look in the mirror. And stop blaming the devil. And look in the mirror and say, you have done this to me. You have kept me poor. You have kept me broke. You're the one because you're a nerd and you're lazy. I'm not saying all of you, but maybe a couple of you in here. It says you. I read that. You will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Three U's. I think God's trying to say something. Everybody say me. God is a God of volition. He gave you choice. Success in life is not up to God. He's already decided what he wants you to be. Come on. Failure doesn't glorify God. Failure doesn't please God. Well, I'm failing forward. I'm failing forward. I'm studying failure. Yeah, you're a big failure. You keep failing forward. Everybody will think you are a failure. Won't you start studying success? (laughs) I read this. I'm like, what? The the word that I want to become is in the Bible. And I looked over my, my... at, at the end, she was my girlfriend. I looked over and said, is that true? Is this, is it true? <laughs> then if I read this book day and night, do what it says, that, that I can have success? My wife looked at me. She said, absolutely. And she said, that is God's will for every Christian. I'm like, what? I thought you had to be poor. I thought you had, I thought you had to be broke. She said, oh, no. She said, my wife, she said, no. A broke life is a sign of a person being broken. Ooh, Bonnie always gets these little nudges. Hmm. And I, I said, wow, I really like that. And, and she said, oh, she said, there's another scripture in the Bible I like. I'm like, really? She said, I love Joseph. How many of you love, how many love the story of Joseph? Oh, and, and it took me to another scripture. Look at this one. This one, this one was interesting. Genesis 39, verse 2. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. Touch your neighbor. Say, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. But look what it says. And he was what? Amen. 
The Lord was with Joseph. That means God likes hanging out with successful people. Yeah. That's the key. Isn't that interesting? And I looked at that, I'm like, wow, God likes, God likes success. Now, our culture doesn't like success, but God does. Our, our culture demonizes successful people. That's, that's where you got to watch out for your brain. Because everything in culture wants to tell you that people who are rich, people who are successful, people who are wealthy, they are demonized in almost everything. Why? Because they want you to think it's class warfare. I never even heard of this term. It's class warfare. They want middle class and poor people to hate rich people. So that politicians can get your vote. And then they can enslave you and keep you poor while they stay rich. So you got to watch out. Got to watch out for these shysters. Why? Because they, 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 they hate capitalism and love socialism. They want equal. We want to make wealth equal. That ain't kingdom. Actually, kingdom, God said... Uh, the guy had had one talent and was a nerd and he was lazy and he didn't do nothing with it. Take it from the one who did nothing. You wicked, you lazy servant. You little socialist. Take it from him. And watch this. I, I, I was thinking, I was kind of thinking he'd give it to the guy who, who had the two and doubled it. But he says, no, take it to the guy who had five and doubled it because he'll, this guy understands how to multiply money. And what's the best person to have in the hands? A guy who thinks poverty and thinks lack and is afraid or a guy who thinks success and I can do it, I can do big things. Whose hands do you want money in if you want to multiply something? So I, I, know, you, I know some of you may have been grown up on Robin Hood and Robin Hood is your, is, is your great example of how he went in and stole money from the rich. Woo, he's a hero. He's a loser. <laughs> he's not to be honored. And, and so we see here that, that I'm, I'm, I'm plowing some soil to get into these, these teachings that success is an obligation. It's a spiritual obligation. 